Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, we're diving deep into one of the most popular and honestly, most powerful microcontroller boards out there. The ESP32 Dev Kit V1 Classic. Whether you're a beginner just getting started or someone who's like, heard a lot about the ESP32 but never actually used it, this is the video for you. All right, so let's get hands on with the ESP32 Dev Kit V1 board. Probably the most popular board among, uh, you know, hobbyists and makers and even professionals. At first glance, it might just look like a little blackboard with some pins and chips on it. But I mean, trust me, it's actually packed with a lot of power. Now this part right here is the shiny silver box. Yeah, that's the ESP32-WROOM32 module. Basically, it's the heart of the board. And inside this little metal case is where like all the important stuff lives. Before we open it up, just a quick note. So while the main chip inside is made by a company called Espressive Systems, the rest of the board is actually made by third-party manufacturers. So um, if you buy an ESP32 Dev Kit V1 online, it might look a bit different. All right, now let's carefully open up this metal cover. It's basically acting like a built-in heat sink and an RF shield. Just a quick warning though, don't try this at home unless, you know, you really know what you're doing. You could damage your board. So yeah, this metal shield helps in two big ways. First, it reduces heat buildup when the chip is running Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And second, it helps block electromagnetic interference, which means like cleaner signals and better performance. And here it is. This is the actual ESP32 chip inside. More specifically, it's called the ESP32-D0WD. This little guy is a dual core processor that runs up to 240 megahertz and it's got built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth all packed into one chip. There's also some onboard memory and a bunch of other supporting components squeezed in under that shield. All right, now that we've seen what's inside the metal shield, let's uh, talk about everything else around it. You know, the stuff that turns this tiny chip into a full-on development board you can actually work with. First up, right here is the micro USB or USB-C port, depending on your board. Uh, this is how we connect it to our computer. It powers the board and lets us upload our code. So yeah, it's kind of doing double duty here. Next, uh, this little component here is called the voltage regulator. It takes the 5 volts coming in from USB and uh, safely brings it down to 3.3 volts. Because, right, the ESP32 chip can't handle 5 volts directly. It's kind of like a bodyguard that makes sure your chip doesn't get fried. Now, uh, there are two buttons on the board. This one is labeled EN. That stands for Enable. So basically, it's a reset button. You press it and the board just restarts. Simple as that. Behind the scenes, it momentarily pulls the EN pin low, which tells the ESP32 to restart and run your code again from the beginning. Super handy when your board freezes or you want to reboot without unplugging it. And then there's this one. It's labeled boot. Uh, this comes in handy in like special cases. For example, when you're flashing firmware manually. But hey, don't worry about that right now. We'll go through it step by step in future videos. Right next to those two buttons, EN and boot, you'll usually spot a tiny chip labeled either C, P2102 or CH340. Now here's something kind of important to know. The ESP32 chip itself uh, doesn't actually have native USB support. So yeah, that means you can't just plug it directly into your computer and start uploading code. Not without a little help. To handle that, the board includes a separate chip, either the CP2102 or the CH340. And this basically acts like a middleman between your computer and the ESP32. It's what we call a USB to serial converter. So like when you upload code from the Arduino IDE or when you're checking out print messages in the serial monitor, that data is actually passing through this tiny little chip first. And finally, 
if you look all along the edges here, you'll see these long rows of pins. But here's the deal. These pins are how the ESP32 talks to the outside world. You can use them for all sorts of things like read a button press, turn on an LED, control a motor, or talk to sensors and displays. It's kind of like giving the ESP32 arms and eyes so it can interact with your project. And the cool part is, you can configure each pin to either read something, like the state of a button, or control something, uh, like turning on an LED. It's like super flexible. But here's something really important. Especially if you're just starting out, not all pins are created equal. Some pins are totally safe to use however you want. And well, others are a little sensitive. So yeah, let's break it down in a super simple way. So although the ESP32 chip technically has like 48 pins in total, uh, only about 30 of them are actually broken out to the pin headers on either side of the development board. And, you know, these pins aren't just limited to one thing. They can sort of be assigned to a bunch of peripheral functions, right? Like power supply, digital I.O., ADC, PWM, capacitive touch, and, well, various communication interfaces. All right, so let's uh, start with the power pins first. The ESP32 is basically a low-power microcontroller and it only needs 3.3 volts to run. Hmm. Now, if you look at this board, you'll see there are like four power-related pins in total. The VEN pin, uh, that one receives 5 volts from the USB input, and uh, then it's regulated down to 3.3 volts using an onboard voltage regulator. And uh, yeah, in case you want to power the ESP32 externally, like from a battery or another 5 volt source, you can just feed that voltage into this same V and pin. Then there's the 3V3 pin, which, you know, actually outputs a stable 3.3 volts. Super handy if you want to power external sensors or modules. And these two pins are ground pins. Okay, now moving on to the GPIOs, the ESP32 development board. Uh, gives you access to about 25 usable GPIO pins. And the cool part is these pins are like super flexible. You can configure them to do a whole bunch of different things, depending on how you write your code. Uh, actually, if you take a look at this image here, it'll show you exactly which pins are safe to use for your projects and kind of which ones you might want to avoid, like those used for flash or boot. Uh, so some pins on the ESP32 are actually called strapping pins. These are kind of special uh, because the ESP32 checks them right when it powers up and based on their state, it decides how the chip should boot. Now here's the tricky part. If you uh, accidentally connect something that pulls these pins high or low at the wrong time, your board might like fail to upload code or even refuse to start properly. Oh, and just a quick tip here. If you're using these pins in your project, especially on a breadboard, be extra careful. I'd actually recommend using soldered connections instead of those loose jumper wires because voltage fluctuations or wobbly connections can seriously mess with your ESP32 or even damage it. Personally, I like using a GPIO expansion board. It just, you know, makes things a lot neater and it keeps those sensitive pins out of the harm's way. Alright, so when you want to read changing signals, like temperature or light, you're going to need to use analog input. The ESP32 actually has two ADC units, uh, that's short for analog to digital converters, and between them, you get up to 15 analog capable pins. It can read voltages anywhere from 0 to 3.3 volts, and it does that with 12-bit resolution. So that means values from 0 all the way up to 4095. Just to give you a quick comparison, regular Arduino boards like the Uno only have 10-bit ADCs, so they give you values from 0 to 1023. So yeah, the ESP32 gives you like 4 times more precision. Pretty cool, right? Oh, and here's a really helpful tip. If your project uses Wi-Fi, it's best to stick with the ADC1 pins. 
because the ADC2 pins actually share hardware with the Wi-Fi system and that can mess with your readings when Wi-Fi is active. Now let's talk about something called PWM, that's Pulse Width Modulation. But hey, don't let the name scare you off. PWM is super handy when you want to control things in a smooth way, like dimming an LED, adjusting the speed of a motor, or even tweaking the volume of a buzzer. Basically anything where you need more than just on or off. Let's say you want an LED to glow softly or fade in and out instead of just blink. Yeah, that's exactly what PWM is for. The ESP32 gives you up to 16 PWM channels and you can assign those to pretty much any GPIO pin, which is like super flexible. All right, moving on. Uh, let's talk about DAX or digital to analog converters. So while ADCs read analog signals into the ES, P32, DACs do the opposite. They let the ESP32 send out smooth, analog-like voltages. For example, if you want to generate a basic audio tone or gradually ramp up a voltage signal, you'd use the DAC for that. Uh, the ESP32 has two built-in DAC channels and they're available on GPIO 25 and 26. And just like the ADCs, they can output voltages between 0 and 3.3 volts. Uh, Alright, now let's move on to how the ESP32 talks to other devices. This is where communication protocols come in. There are three main serial communication protocols you'll come across. UART, I2C and SPI. Each one has its own purpose and we'll break them down one by one with simple examples so you won't get confused. Let's start with UART, which uh, stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, or you know, just think of it as serial communication. It's the method that's used every single time we upload code to the ESP32, or when we open up the serial monitor to print debug messages, like Hello World, or whatever we are testing. The ESP32 actually has three hardware UARTs, called UART0, UART1, and UART2. And yeah, each one has its own transmit and receive lines built in. So UART0 is the one that's used by default for uploading code and talking to the serial monitor. And because of that, it's kind of tricky to use it for any other serial devices at the same time. But good news, UART1 and UART2 are free to use and you can totally connect them to external modules or devices like a GPS module or maybe a GSM module. Anything that supports UART. Here's the cool part. The ESP32 lets you remap UART to like almost any GPIO pin. So if the default TX and RX pins are busy or just not exposed on your board, you can actually assign UART to other pins using code. Super flexible. For instance, UART1 by default uses GPIO 9 and 10, but on many ESP32 boards, those pins might be like hidden or already tied up with something else like the onboard SPI flash. So in that case, what we do is just reassign UART1 to some different pins and you can do that in code like this. Here, one means we're using UART1, and then we've assigned RX to GPIO 16 and TX to GPIO 17. And yeah, you can do the same thing with URT2 as well. Just pick the pins that work for your project and plug them into the code. So I2C is great when you uh, want to connect multiple sensors or modules. And the best part is it only needs two wires. Let's say you've got like an OLED display, a temperature sensor and maybe a real time clock. Well, all of those can actually share the same two lines using I2C. Pretty neat, right? Those two wires are called SDA, that's the data line, and SCL, which is the clock line. Now, on the ESP32, the default I2C pins are uh, GPIO21 for SDA and GPIO22 for SCL. But, you know, you can also change those if needed, depending on your project. Okay, now let's talk about SPI, which is kind of like the high-speed cousin of I2C. 
SPI is perfect when speed really matters. Like when you're dealing with an SD card, a TFT screen, or maybe some flash memory chips. The most common SPI pins on the ESP32 are uh, GPIO 23, 19, 18, and 5. And here's another fun one. The ESP32 actually has built-in capacitive touch sensing. So yeah, you can make a touch button using just a wire. No extra hardware needed, which is kinda cool. The ESP32 has 10 GPIOs that are touch sensitive and they can like detect tiny changes in electrical charge when your finger gets close. Great for interactive projects. Alright, that's all for this video. In the next ones, we'll be diving deeper into each of these topics one step at a time. Thanks a lot for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe if you found this helpful. See you in the next one.